Hey y'all, new day, new verses as we continue on into Matthew 21. Today we are verses, doing verses 28 to the end of the chapter, right up into the start of 22. So here we go. 28. But what do you think of this? A man with two sons told the older boy, Son, go out and work in the vineyard today. The son answered, No, I won't go. But later he changed his mind and went anyway. Then the father told the other son, You go. And he said, Yes, sir, I will. But he didn't go. Which of the two obeyed his father? They replied, Well, the first. Then Jesus explained his meaning. I tell you the truth. Corrupt tax collectors and prostitutes will get into the kingdom of heaven before you do. For John the Baptist came and showed you the right way to live when you didn't believe him, while tax collectors and prostitutes did. Even when you saw this happening, you refused to believe him and repent of your sin. Now listen to another story. A certain landover planted a vineyard built a wall around it, dug a pit for pressing out grape juice, and built a lookout tower. Then he leased the vineyard to tenant farmers and moved to another country. At the time of the grape harvest, he sent his servants to collect his share of the crop. But the farmers grabbed his servants, beat one, killed one, and stoned another. So the landowners sent a larger group of his servants to collect for him. But the results were the same. Finally, the owner sent his son, thinking, Surely they will respect my son. But when the tenant farmers saw his son coming, they said to one another, Here comes the heir of this estate. Come, let us kill him and get the estate for ourselves. So they grabbed him, dragged him out of the vineyard, and murdered him. When the owner of the vineyard returns, Jesus asked, What do you think he will do to those farmers? The religious leaders replied, He will put them, men, wicked men to a horrible death, and lease the vineyard to others who will give his share to the, of the crop each harvest. And then Jesus asked them, Didn't you ever read this in Scripture? The stone that the builders rejected now has come, become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing, and it is wonderful to see. I tell you, the kingdom of heaven will be taken away from you and given to a nation that will produce the proper fruit. Anyone who stumbles over that stone will be broken into pieces, and it will crush anyone it falls on. When the leading priests and Pharisees heard this parable, they realized he was telling the story about them. They were the wicked farmers. They wanted to arrest him, but they were afraid of the crowds who considered Jesus to be a prophet. I, I love the beautiful rhyming that goes all the way through this chapter, and, and really, it's all throughout the Bible, this beautiful imagery, like a woven quilt or a song, where everything just kind of connects together and weaves. Because when I was looking at this, even these two parables convey two beautiful truths in different ideas. See, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they were the ones who were supposed to know better. They were the ones who studied Torah. They understood the Tanakh. They were intimately versed in it. So saying, didn't you ever read in the scripture? He's saying, hey, you know that verse that you guys mutter all the time to yourselves that you know well? Here's what it really means. And combining the two, it almost seems like an invitation to think about people differently. Because the one that always threw, well, a lot of places, is 43, a nation that will produce the proper fruit. Because I don't think it's about, you know, the flag that's being waved over that nation. I, I think it is the people group, the ones who share similar characteristics, nature. So, a, a tribe almost, if you will. Because from here, if you take the two in tandem, he seems to be calling out the people who should know better about living in love, living the way God shows. I mean, there was no, no New Testament for the people in the New Testament. They only had the Tanakh. And Jesus references it out one side and up one side and down the other, going over and over again. You know, I've, the Lord has told you what human what to do. Love mercy. Live justly. Walk humbly with your God. All of these things are straight through the Tanakh, and they're things, the Old Testament, all of these things are pointing to things that should be understood by these Pharisees and Sadducees. But he's doing exactly what their ancestors did. Something he's called them out for earlier in Matthew. Here he's doing it with the parable form. You know, the judges who were sent to rescue Israel when they had gone astray, well, they were completely ignored. The prophets were lucky to be ignored. Some, many, were put to death. And then finally, Jesus showing the right way. 
saying to these people who think they're in the know and think they're safe that, well, it's not your kingdom, it's God's kingdom. Bear the fruit of it if you want to be in it. Because the harvest is a good crop, it's a crop of love. The fruits of the Spirit, patience, self-control, discipline, kindness, long-suffering, these beautiful things that are a source of life for those who get to experience them. When you meet a patient person, there is a peace almost about it. When you meet people who exemplify these fruits of the Spirit, they're walking out what Jesus is calling. And I think it's interesting that it's almost, well, even using the, the illustration of a vineyard, it's needing to produce the right fruit, be of the right character. Because if you're supposed to look out for the orphan, the widow, and the immigrant, something that is all throughout the Tanakh, the Old Testament, and they're ignoring them, nay, walking over the top of them, denying them justice, well, then what is the difference between them and Pharaoh? What is the difference between Jerusalem and Babylon in that moment? Because if you're acting against the way God shows us to live, why? He gives us so much love. He pours out mercies new every morning. And even in Psalm 118, which he is quoting with the, the stone the builders rejected, now has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing, and it's wonderful to see. It's a praise, a, a song, a psalm of praise song. A little tongue tied there. All of psalms are hymns. Here we see even more. It's this place of praise that God is triumphant and greater than the enemies surrounding the person in Psalm 118. And so, talking about the fact that God is doing it a completely different way, because the builders, well, no, the, that stone is useful for nothing. And the one who makes stone is going, no, 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 it's right here. It goes here as the cornerstone. Because what humans generally deem a value and what God generally deems a value don't always line up. And I think that's because of how far we have fallen. You know, we allow ourselves, our cultures, our lives to be run roughshod in many places over the classic, <laughs> over by the classic three spiritual entities that screw up most of humanity. Chasing after wealth, chasing after sex, chasing after power. Pretty much every single one of those things breaks down into it. It comes to this place of you chasing after a different god. If you're focused on wealth, on finance, on coffers overflowing with gold, why are you not focusing on the God of all provision who makes bread rain from the sky and water come from rocks? This is the God we serve. Do we believe it? Because God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And if we're listening to what he tells us to do, we have a peace in doing it. You know, lusting after, well, let's face it, putting up the human body as a piece of meat through billboards, pop culture, to the point where we desensitize many groups about sex rather than it having to be an intimate moment where it becomes about notches in the belt or headboard, where it becomes about being Lay mech in the bedroom. And for those of you who don't know the reference, it's the guy basically after Cain who says, Well, if Cain killed one person, look how many I've killed. And has taken multiple wives, essentially as slaves to himself. Not a decent human being, by any stretch of the imagination. Power and delusion, at best. Because people who think they have it, do they have power over life and death? No. Everyone's bound to die. Time marches on, inconsequential of your pit's opinion, and chance will take wealth away from you as quickly as it brought it. So what is the purpose of chasing after that as well? And yes, that is a mile-high view of Ecclesiastes as an overview. But it is these questions that ask, what are we really chasing after? 
Because the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they refused to believe John, like in verse 32, because they were indignant. They were too busy being offended by the fact that they were called out for doing something inappropriate, rather than taking the wisdom and learning. Something that Proverbs would call them a fool about. Now, isn't that nifty? Or at the very least interesting, that God's own word would call out the nature of what they're doing well before Jesus showed up on the scene, who is God's word made flesh. Perfectly God and perfectly human, calling out what has been there the entire time, but not seen. Giving eyes to see and ears to hear, so that the wisdom that comes from him can multiply and mature and grow. Keeping to his word. That what wisdom you have will be expounded on. And if you turn from God, what little you have will be taken. It's you have to chase after God. And I really do believe that's why the idea of common sense is no longer common. Because it is... I... Just be point blank with it. If you're raised in the Western world, you're influenced by Christianity. If you have common sense, it's because you were raised in a Christian environment. And I don't mean the religious one, I mean a Christian environment where other centric love is the way to go. <laughs> where you get told by your parent, well, if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything at all. Well, that's discipline and discretion. And only a fool opens their mouth without thinking. So it stands to reason that if you have common sense, it is because God is the one giving you that sense. It stands to reason that God is more interested in a nation that will produce the proper fruit than he is about the flag or anything else over it, especially since the body of Christ is one body, made up of people from all over the world. People of every tongue and nation make up the body of Christ. So why would it be about a flag? Why would it be about a person holding a stewardship position in governmental leadership? Wouldn't it be more about chasing after the Lord? In all things. Because if you're interested in having the world, you're chasing after stuff that's not worth having. What the world deems of value is as smoke. Try to grab it and it will vanish before you have the opportunity. Play on the playground that God has given us. And prosper because he's giving new life and moving us forward from childish to childlike. We have this good, good father who sees the struggle, who knows the difficulties. And I think that's the beauty of the first parable here. Is God knows the heart of the compromised tax collector, the, the, the compromised person, the corrupt tax collector, the prostitute, the criminal. The sick who know they are sick and go to the one who can make them well. John, telling everyone, turn from your sins. Because God is coming. He's doing something new. And in the same moment, it doesn't necessarily feel new as much as it feels like a fulfillment of a promise to come. After all, the promise of Jesus crushing the serpent is in Genesis. It's given to Eve just after they eat the apple, where God tells the snake that his head will be crushed from a descendant of the woman, that his heel will be bruised. His symmetry that God will take that lethal strike and die in our place so that that evil may be gone, done and gone away with. Well, if the evil's done and gone away with, why is the world so rampant? Because he hasn't come back yet. This is the interim. This is the show, folks, where we get to decide what kind of humans we want to be. Do we want to chase after Christ, the source of all life, to live with the truly human one, to be with our Abba in heaven, because no one gets to the Father except through the Son? So what do we want? Do we want to be children of the Lord or children of this world? 
It's a very much black and white option. You cannot serve two masters. And if you're struggling in the gray area, take this parable as a place of hope. Because the tax uh, the first son, go out and do this. No, I'm not going to. I'm not going to love others. I'm not going to surrender my will. I'm not going to behave like a true being of Christ. And then realizing, goes, what, um, what, uh, I should probably do better. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to go do what I was told to do by God. I'm going to go love. I'm going to go live the life that he has shown me, the grace, the mercy, the compassion, the forgiveness. I'm going to live it out. As opposed to the other one who said, oh, yep, I am absolutely going to follow everything that's in here then why do you hate people? Why are you afraid of people acting against you? Perfect love casts out all fear. No weapon formed against us shall prosper. So what is it? I mean, we'll find a little later in Matthew where the very idea of those who live by the sword, die by the sword, is in the very text. So who do you want to belong to? Because if you belong to God, then the fear of the world is cast out. What can mere mortals do to us? Inflict pain and death? Well, Paul and Jesus both have said that if you're afraid of that, you're missing the point. It is better to die, and what is it? Um, to live as Christ, to die is gain. So, what is it? Because the dividing line is right there. It's not this tribe or that tribe or this thing or that thing. No, no, no. It's, are you going to live a life of love? Self-sacrificial, other-centric love. Where it's not about me, me, me. It's about other. It's about compassion. It is living a life where it's not about who's higher or who's lower. It's that all humanity is created equal before God. That He is the one who sorts us out. We do not. Remember, like I said before, the wheat and the weeds don't know which is which. Only the one harvesting them do, because tares look so much like wheat. Only the one sorting truly knows. So if it's not about us condemning each other about who's more shiny, and it's not about chasing after what the world deems a value, sex, power, money, then what are you following? Because I know this sounds kind of reductive, and it's because it's trying to get a point across. God pours out love. For those who start off at odds with him and then go, wait, this way is better. I'm going to do that. They're the son that obeyed. Remember, Jesus is very fond of welcoming the prodigal son home. The very idea of it is from here. The cultural idea we have now in the West of it is because of him. Of welcoming that lost child home. Glad that they return, thought dead, but seen alive. And so, in being thought off, they have the opportunity to really be alive. Something the other brother didn't do. Don't worry, we'll get to that parable too. All of this, all the way through, is an invitation. Do you want to live with God being God? Or do you want to be God? Because we don't have the right to murder. We're not only allowed, not allowed to, we don't get to. We don't have the capacity in us. All of these things the world deems okay, the violence, the hatred, the behaving like savage, wild animals, like beasts, we don't get to do that. We get to live in love. We get to reflect the same kindness and compassion and generosity that God pours out to us, to others. Because He is a good, good Father. And we want people to see that truth. We want people 
all people, to turn from the way of the world, to stop saying no to God and start saying yes to Him, like the first son. Because God is coming home. Wrongs are going to be set right. There's no doubts about it. The question is, where do you want to stand on it? Love or not? Because remember, there are three things that will last forever, according to Paul, which is the Spirit-inspired Word of God. Faith, hope, love. The greatest of these, love. So those are what's going to endure. Why would you chase after anything else? It is the reality of things not seen. But we know it to be true. Why can a Christ follower love? Because we have lo been loved first. We have love poured into our very being, made in love to give love. Because why would God create if he didn't have an intent or do it out of love? I know it is not easy. And I know in a world where even the people looking after the vineyard start acting like bloodthirsty savages, it's really difficult to maintain hope. We are given a defiant hope. One does, does not rely on anything from this world, and so it cannot be taken by anything in this world or from this world. Same with joy, same with love. All of it coming from God, because He is the source intimate, personal relationship where He pours into us so we may pour out into others. This constant, beautifully interwoven nature of other-centric love. And so the humanity becomes almost as beautifully woven as the text. That when we have failure moments, there are places of love. Where justice and mercy are two sides of the same coin. Much like the two commandments of which is greater, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and might, and love others as you love yourself. Two sides of the same coin. Two ways of understanding that if you think yourself God, you will be sorely mistaken. If you humble yourself enough to know that you need God to see you through it and reach out to Him. Just remember, just reaching out to a God you can't see is an act of faith. I just ask Paul. So if we're given the opportunity to love, why don't we take it? Because the same thing is almost seen here. The two sides of the same coin. This idea that God loves. It's, he died for our sins. So the past is rectified when we give to Him. The future is not ours to worry about it because tomorrow is just that tomorrow. It will never truly come. Because the moment tomorrow is today, it is no longer tomorrow. It's today. A place of the present. A gift. To be intentional with our living. Intentional with our choices. Intentional with the acts of our tongue and hand. Our heart and our mind. So that we can truly shema. Hear what the Lord has to say. Hear, O Israel, and know that the Lord is one. Well, Israel just means one who wrestles with God. Then wouldn't the true body of Christ still be Israel? Those who wrestle with God. In the struggle, the trial, the difficulty, and say, no, 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 I, I know I'm having a hard time with this. I know my world is showing, but I'm going to give to God. I'm going to say, I know you don't know how. I, I don't know how to have hope when the world is, keeps telling me it's on fire and tries to shove fear down my throat. But I'm going to give it to God. I'm going to say, God, you're greater. You're over this. I trust you. Which says, well, I don't know how to love others. Especially since I don't know how to love myself. How am I supposed to love my enemies? Take that and give it to God. Much like we see in the text. Fine, I believe, Lord. Help me with my unbelief. And he will. And he does. Then and now.
So when it's a question of, Lord, I don't know how to have faith that you're greater than this because I keep getting told that this is happening and that's happening and everybody's afraid of COVID and what's going to happen next. But I'm going to take that fear. I'm going to play it before you. And I'm going to say, you are my God. You are my King. So no matter what comes my way, you are greater still, Lord. That's a gift. It's a gift to trust in Him. And even just in doing so is an act of remarkably defiant faith. Because it is laying yourself down, picking up your cross, and following Him at least long enough to admit that you need Him. And when you realize you need Him, it gets easier to run to Him. Remember, He said it Himself, He came not to save the healthy, but to those who are know they are sick. And know they're broken. In a broken world. Reveling in weakness, because it's where God shows His strength. Instead of acting like barbarians of, well, I'm greater than you, and I'm greater than you, that's... You can't compare two human beings any more than you could compare two snowflakes. Because the cruel, from a certain point of view, truth of the matter, someone will always be better at something than you. It can sting to hear, but it's a truth that will set you free. Because if you stop trying to compare yourself with others and just be you, well then, then you're able to truly shema. With that last little word there, ma'od. It's like, okay, well, what does this all have to do with the parable of the evil farmers? Evil will be done away with. Don't repay evil with evil. Repay evil with good. Live the kind of life that we are shown. So that like the two parable, like the parable of the two sons, we can say, oh, well, I'm going to do it. I said no at the beginning, but you know what? I'm going to do it so that we can live like the actual people who will produce the crop. Because those who think they're in those places and aren't, it's going to be stripped from them. God is not big on injustice. And when we would perpetuate it, it's a great way to get on His bad side. <laughs> and a great way to be disciplined. And even that is a place of joy. Because God disciplines the ones He loves. Any good parent does. As if these farmers, the parable of the evil farmers, if they had taken heed and just done what they said they would do in the first time, yes, we will live the kind of other-centric love we have been shown. Then he wouldn't, the farmer would not have had to send his son. Would not have had to send the different servants. They just would have turned and said, Oh, hey, here you go. But they didn't. The religious leaders decided they wanted to speak hate over others. That they wanted to say, You are lesser for the reason that I deem as such. And that will be taken from you. Instantly. Without warning. Because he comes as a thief in the night. And it will be given to those who live love. who are interested in seeing wrongs set right. Not by force or their own hand, but by living the love we're shown, by living the generosity, by, if you'll pardon the parliaments, being the change we want to see in the world. 